You know what they say, what happens on SmackDown stays on SmackDown. Unless it's me talking about it. How you doing folks, my name is Marcus Stewart and welcome to Call It In The Ring. We are breaking down SmackDown Live September 25th, 2018. Still taking place in Denver, Colorado. Uh, because as I always say, what happens in Denver stays in Denver. At least for 24 hours. And then it moves on to another city. Anyways, we'll get started with, uh, jump right into it. We've got Miss TV, or so it seems, because we have R-Truth and Carmella sitting in the ring, or standing, I guess. And from a distance, I didn't recognize Carmella because she has uh, dyed her hair. It's uh, red, like reddish, reddish brown. Um, kind of looks like Lita. Actually, remember how Lita dyed her hair? It's so similar to that. Um, but yeah, from a distance, I, I, for a split second, I thought it was Maria Canellis before they uh, zoomed in on her. But Truth and Carmilla have hijacked Miss TV and they have renamed it Truth TV because uh, they can pretty much, you know, do whatever they want. And Daniel Bryan will be Truth's first guest on his show. And Brian comes out and he's really amused by this. He says that this show is already better than uh, Miss TV ever has been. Um, and before he can kind of really, you know, Truth asks him about uh, the the Super Showdown match between him and Miz, where the winner will challenge the WWE champion for the title at some undetermined uh, date in the future. But before Brian can get to that, we got to take a seven second dance break. And with that, Truth and Carmella just start dancing and there's music that hits. And it's pretty funny. And Brian is just like, what is happening? And once they get that out of the way, uh, Truth asks if it felt uh, cathartic to, uh, to finally get his hands on Miz. Um, <laughs> Brian asks if Truth is, uh, knows what catharsis means. And Truth plays it off because he clearly does not know. But he's like, you know, I, I know what it means, but you should probably explain it for everyone here that might not know. And then... Brian talks about the, the meaning of catharsis, saying that, you know, it's basically a, a release and, you know, talking about how he has waited for years to get back in the ring and, and to uh, punch Miz in the face and also to uh, to prove that he's the best. He did not just come back just to come back. He came back so that he could become WWE champion for one, one more time because the last time he held it, he only got to defend it once before he went down uh, with his injury. So he wants to get back to that mountaintop, and he talks about uh, Miz having, you know, having to cheat to win all of his matches, and goes on for a bit, and then eventually uh, <laughs> Miz interrupts and is very upset to see that his show has been uh, stolen from him. Um, he reminds, uh, he asks Truth what the hell he's doing, and Truth reminds him that hey, you know, two weeks ago I beat you, which. If you were a champion and it was a title match, your title will be mine. But since you don't have a title, I just took your show instead. And Miz is like, you can't take something that was never yours. You know, it's my show. And then he turns his attention to Brian saying that the reason Brian can't win is because he he can't cheat. He has a, his moral compass gets in the way because Miz admits that, yeah, I cheated to beat you. But that's because I win by any means necessary which you don't have the uh, the guts to do because you're too um, proud of your your morals. And that a Super Showdown, that's going to be his downfall because Miz will do whatever it takes to become WWE Champion for a second time. Eventually, Truth and Miz get back into it with Truth banning Miz from Truth TV for life. He is done. He will never be on the show again. Again, Miz brings up that it's my show. You can't just... It's not yours. Um, but he's interrupted by another seven-second dance break, which sends a very frustrated and uh, annoyed Miz to the back, where he is immediately greeted by Paige in the gorilla position. And he complains to Paige about what's going on, and Paige is like, well, you should go back out there, because uh, well, I think I forgot to mention that prior to him leaving, Truth challenged him, like, hey, if you want your show back, beat me in a match. But Miz did not accept but Paige says, hey, you know, sounds like you have your uh, your window, your opportunity to get the show back from what I heard. So if you want your show back so bad, take Truth's challenge now. Go back out there and beat him. Miz reluctantly goes back out. 
as the dance party is still happening. And we get our first match of the night, The Miz versus R-Truth. Daniel Bryan sitting on commentary. Uh, decent back and forth match. Uh, the only thing of note was just Daniel talking about uh, Miz and giving, actually giving Miz some props saying like, you know what? I'll, you know, I'll say that Miz isn't the best wrestler. And I, for a year said he was a, a terrible wrestler, but I will say that he's gotten better, um, which continues to boggle his mind. Cause he's like, he's gotten, a, he's become a better wrestler, but he doesn't use that to win his matches clean. He's always has to resort to a, a shortcut of some sort. And then just kind of ripping on uh, the uh, Mrs. It kicks, saying that they're he, he is a funny thing or a funny analysis, saying that when he starts doing it, and you know Corey's like, yeah, those are the It kicks, and Brian's like, really? That it's like that's that's what you call them? And he's like, see, that's and notice how Miz doesn't turn his hips good enough. That's why his kicks lack impact. Which I always like little like analysis like that for wrestlers of like people that you know like are commentated that were in the ring, they're kind of breaking down like why. A move is effective or why it hurts this was a you know this was more of a a one-off kind of almost like half joke but i remember um actually taz used to be really good at that when he was on uh, commentary michael cole back in his day he'd be he always thought he was pretty great at like someone doing a hold and then he would explain why the the hold hurt and what made it effective as well as what the the person on the receiving end would have to do to get out of it and i we don't really get enough of that at all really anymore uh despite Corey Graves being on commentary and being a wrestler you know he'll, he'll touch on things now and then but it's not like that so I wouldn't mind more um in in-depth analysis like that uh Miz picks up the win after hitting the skull crushing finale and then to add some salt to the wound hitting stealing uh Brian's running knee which he actually does a pretty pretty good one and beating Miz uh Brian immediately hits the ring and Miz bails and uh, Miz is the uh, stands tall segment. So Truth TV, unfortunately, will be a, a a one hit wonder. But this was really entertaining, and Truth got a really big reaction, uh, as he normally does. Because how could you not like our Truth? I mean, come on, come on. Backstage, Charlotte Flair is in the middle of a photo shoot with a I think her new T shirt. And then out of nowhere, Becky Lynch comes in and starts attacking her and beats the crap out of her. And the cameraman, despite a crazy woman assaulting another person, he just keeps taking pictures. And Becky's yelling at her like, yeah, take a picture of this and this. And it's just kicking her and stomping her. And then, and the guy is like completely nonplussed by this, um, this, this crime, basically. This is a, this is a crime taking place. This is assault. And, and maybe battery, and he's just like, oh, I guess, well, you know, taking pictures, you know, I guess he's really dedicated to photography, he wants to, you know, he's, he, he can't just stop and um, maybe alert um, the authorities, or, or Paige, or maybe get someone to help this uh, defenseless woman, but he's like, hey, you know, I, I've, I used to be a war photographer, maybe, and I, I'm used to being um, in the middle of combat zones, and, and shit popping off, and I have to get a picture of it, so maybe that's what he had in mind as this was happening but yeah he um might have got some good pics i'll have to see if there's uh if there was any good pictures of that taken maybe i should make that the uh the feature image for this episode <laughs> to give the guy so that his uh his work is not in vain next up the new day come out to the rain because Big E is going to be taking on Sheamus. Uh, the bar is already out there and then new day comes out and they talk about how yeah they might play too much but ultimately, they respect the bar, and to prove it, they are going to um, embark on the Say Something Nice Challenge, and pretty much it's exactly what it sounds like. They're going to try and say nice things about Cesaro and Sheamus. Uh, they say that despite Cesaro having um, weird nipples, <laughs> or irregular areolas, I think is what they said, and looking like a Swiss Jason Statham, which... Xavier points out, like, that's not a really an insult. Like, we like his movies. He's cool. You know? Um, so, like, that's a nice thing to say. They're like, hey, you know, you that's cool. You're great. And then they turn to Seamus and like, hey, you know, Seamus, despite you having a very distracting mohawk, the carpet always matches. And we never get the end of that because Seamus grabs the mic and talks about how it's the same old from New Day. And despite all their jokes and antics that it won't matter because the bar will take the tag titles from them at super showdown in Melbourne, Australia. 
This brings us to our match, which was a nice hoss fight between two big powerhouses. Great hard-hitting match, uh, as you would expect probably from these two. Um, and eventually, uh, Sheamus picked up the win after he countered the big ending into a big old brogue kick, knocking uh, Biggie off his socks. And right now, the bar has all the momentum. That's the second singles match that the uh, bar has gotten over the New Day. So I would imagine next week, Xavier Woods might get a shot at one of them. But yeah, just simple momentum building to their uh, tag title match. Paige is back to stage and tells AJ that in the contract signing tonight between him and Samoa Joe for their uh, match at Super Showdown to, at the very least, try not to destroy everything around the ring because, you know, those those monitors on the uh, announce table are really expensive. Those little, those small little screens, um, despite WWE being a billion dollar company and having their stock prices being at the highest they've ever been, um, they can't afford those to keep paying for those those tiny little monitors that probably cost about $30 at Brands Mart, if even. Um, AJ say, hey, the only thing I want to wreck tonight is Samoa Joe, if it comes to that. Lana goes to get Rusev because Rusev comes out to the ring and he wants to ask Aiden English why he turned on him last week. He says he, he that's all he wants. He just wants an answer. Uh, he says that English had betrayed him on the on Rusev Day, the greatest holiday of them all, which makes Aiden a traitor. How could you do that? I mean, why would you betray your best friend on Rusev Day of all days? You just couldn't wait until the next day, which admittedly is also Rusev Day, or maybe next week, which I think also falls on Rusev Day. But still, you picked a bad day to do that. Aiden English comes out in his own shirt, his own kind of Rusev Day shirt was this happy Aiden Day. And he talks about how no one cared about Rusev until he came along and helped elevate him to uh, his popularity. He has video footage of their first uh, meeting, like the first declaration of Rusev Day back in September of last year. So it's been a it's been a year, which I didn't really really didn't register to me until I saw the desk. Like, wow, that was a year ago. And um, which is still one of my favorite re recent segments is the, the the crowning or the the declaration of Rusev Day, um, mainly the end where um, that was when Randy Orton came out of nowhere because he was feuding with Rusev at the time and RKO'd. Aiden, as he was really hitting that high note for the Rusev Day, I thought that was hilarious at the time. And, you know, we see kind of all their history as a team, um, which is funny because they never actually won anything together. So it's kind of like, eh, I mean, you guys were popular. Absolutely. You just never really actually uh, accomplished anything of significance. But Aiden says that, you know, we could be. We could be great if it was just the two of us like it was before. And he blames all of the troubles on Lana. He turns his attention to Lana saying everything went south when she got involved. And then he has another video package showing all the times that Lana has uh, mucked things up for them. Of course, you know, not mentioning all the things that Lana has done to, to help them. But he focuses on the bad things as a, as a true villain would. Uh, Lana is, of course, pissed about this and grabs the mic and starts yelling at Aiden saying that she stuck by Rusev for years way before he ever you know hooked up with him he's just like i, I like that she says like i even got him a tank to write out on at wrestlemania which yeah i mean aiden hasn't done anything to top that so that's still one of the best entrances in wrestlemania history honestly um and you know just keeps uh just keeps yelling at aiden and then aiden decides to he brings up that you're so honest you're so honest oh my god i just combined the word lana and honest so, but what he was saying is that lana is so honest you know you always keep it real with your husband which is fantastic so if that's how you are maybe you should tell him about that night in milwaukee and then he just drops the mic and leaves and the whole crowd is like oh like and Rusev is confused, and Lana is confused at one. She's got her mouth open like, what the, what? And everyone eventually starts chanting for Milwaukee. And yeah, we're a night in Milwaukee. What is, what does that mean? Something scandalous, perhaps? Um, 
And backstage, we see uh, Becky and uh, Rusev and Lana kind of talking about this Milwaukee business. Like, Lana saying, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Rusev, of course, asking, like, what? What is it? What is this? What? And then Becky Lynch, of all people, comes up. Because apparently she has a match with Lana later in the night. And she just kind of makes fun of Lana for this Milwaukee crap, saying, like, oh, that sounds bad for you. And then kind of threatens Lana, saying, like, you know... I'm going to basically beat you tonight and you know, you have bad, you have worse things to worry about tonight than uh, Milwaukee, basically. Next up, we have Naomi and Asuka teaming up to take on Sonya Deville and Mandy Rose. Uh, the Iconics are on commentary for this. Um, this started over um, hair, hair issues uh backstage i guess earlier in the day uh oscar was commenting uh naomi's bundles her, her curls and naomi's like girl what you know about bundles which i mean oscar would know a lot because last i checked oscar owned a, a hair salon or, or, or a chain of hair salons i believe or something like that in japan i don't know if she still does but i remember hearing that uh, a few years ago so uh, she actually would know quite a bit about that um and then uh, mandy and, and sonia came up and were making fun saying like oh your hair is garbage your hair is trash and it goes to touch naomi's hair and then oscar straight up snatches um mandy's arm because oscar will uh, murder you if you uh, cross her. And that's what set up this match. And this match was nothing special. It, it's always nice to see Sonya and Manda, Mandy. And I'm, I wish we saw more of them. Because I like both of them. I think that Sonya. Uh, despite her MMA kind of gimmick. Sort of kind of getting. Um, it's lunch eaten by Ronda Rousey. And to a somewhat lesser extent. Uh, Shayna Baszler down in NXT. She's good. I, I like just her presentation and her look. And I think she she's like a, a, a dark horse in terms of the women's division. And I like Mandy Rose. Mandy's entrance is one of my favorite entrances right now. And I like her. Um, she's getting better in the ring. I think she's solid. And she was solid here too. And I just think that she has a, a charisma about her that I like. So I think both of them are, are, are have got bright futures if they stay on the right track. Um, that future did not start tonight because uh, the uh, Naomi and Asuka won after delivering a double kick to the head of Sonya, knocking her the hell out. Uh, the Iconics this entire time would just kind of be in their normal selves, just joking around, ripping on uh, the good guys and talking about their match at, uh, talking about Super Showdown because, you know, obviously they're Australian, so they're going home. So yeah, nothing to see here all that much, but good to see Sonya and Manda. Next up, we have uh, Ty Dillinger, who lives, he is still alive, taking on Shinsuke Nakamura, United States champion Shinsuke Nakamura. We have now uh, crossed the border into Nak America, and this match does not last very long. Ty puts up a good fight, but before he can kind of maybe seal the deal, Randy Orton comes out of nowhere and starts beating the crap out of Ty Dillinger for some reason. And uh, once again, Shinsuke kind of s uh, slinks away here. And he just starts beating the crap out of Ty. And uh, ex with the, the DDT, the hanging DDT on the floor as the, the final exclamation point. And after Orton, uh, the Orton tornado uh, leaves town, uh, Shinsuke goes to leave. And then he kind of stops and is like, well, I'm the champ. You know, I should probably, uh, I should probably get the last word in so to speak he doesn't say this but you know that's pretty much what he's thinking and he hits a kinshasa to tie on the floor which sends him it looks brutal because he kicks him and then it, he's right up against the ring so he kicks his head basically into the led board at the and the, the ring apron so that looked great and and, and bad for ty but yeah, it's interesting that uh, Randy is, he if you notice, he continues to attack people that seemingly revolve around Nakamura, despite not actively going after Nakamura or his title. And I don't know if that's just coincidence or if that's actually going to lead to something. But at the same time, Ord said he, he's going after the heroes of WWE, and Shinsuke is not one of those anymore he has, since he has turned his back on the universe. So I, 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 even though he keeps kind of a... Uh, lightly uh kind of revolving around shinsuke it's like right now orton can only if he can only see good guys like if, if good guy 
if being a hero gave off some sort of like body heat or, or, or aura, like that's all his vision is set to. Like bad guys are invisible to him, basically. So maybe that's why Shinsuke has uh, been uh, immune to his wrath so far. But yeah, uh, I interesting surprise to see uh, Ty Dillinger get uh, beaten within an inch of his life here. Uh, backstage, we see Lana again, and he's, she's basically asking why Rusev is even entertaining the idea that Aiden might be onto something. Uh, Rusev says, like, no, I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not saying he's right. I'm just wondering what the hell is going on. We eventually get uh, Orton backstage, and uh, the interviewer later, whose, whose name I still have not learned, because uh, it's not Charlie Caruso. I, she's kind of newer. Still need to learn. Is it Dasha? Is that Dasha? I know there's a lady named Dasha. Is that her? Maybe. Um... But she asked, like, hey, what the is Ty Dillinger your next victim that you talked about last week when you uh, took a uh, production truck worker hostage? And um, if that person may have not filed for charges for um, assault as well. <laughs> um, Orton, in a great response, just kind of looks like, what the hell? And he just says, like, no. <laughs> like, Ty's not my next victim, which is kind of the re- what I was going to tell. I was like, Ty Dillinger? Like, that's who you go after next? But Orton... Speaking the minds of anyone paying attention is like, of course not. And he says that the reason he, the reason he targeted Ty was pretty simple. He said that 10 thing, you know, Ty Dillinger's perfect 10 gimmick, it just pisses him off. Which was verbatim pretty much what he said. He's like, that 10 thing just pisses me off. That's the only reason he did what he did, which I thought was, uh, was pretty great. I like, uh, you don't get that enough sometimes with, like, heels... Or even baby faces when they give a reason for doing something. Like, just being that cut and dry. Like, it actually reminds me of, um... Ten years ago, I think now, back in 08, when, uh, Mike Knox... If anyone remembers Mike Knox, who was a former ECW, um... The WWE version of ECW, uh, superstar, who eventually came to Raw. He was a big guy with an even bigger beard. And he started a feud with Rey Mysterio completely out of the blue. It just started beating him up. And then when the interviewer backstage asked Mike, like, why have you been targeting Rey Mysterio? And normally you would expect some long or, like, kind of somewhat convoluted reasoning of, like, well, he did this to me, so da 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 But Mike Knox's response was, ah, I just, I don't know, I just, because I could. I just like, I like hurting him. Like, that was all he said. He's like, yeah, I just, I did it because I could, and I like it. And it was no, that was it. That was all there was to it. And I remember just loving that at the time. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So he, I mean, yeah, he, he beaten up Rey Mysterio because he enjoys hurting Rey Mysterio. No, not really complicated. So yeah, Orton beat up Ty Dillinger because his gimmick makes him mad. <laughs> Good stuff. Next up, we have Becky Lynch taking on Lana. And uh, during the match, the crowd is chanting Milwaukee. Uh, Milwaukee is a very popular city now. I wonder what the city of Milwaukee, if they've uh, caught wind of this, what they think of um, of this whole thing. I mean, WWE might be bringing tourism to Milwaukee because people will be like, ooh, if I can sleep with Lana, I should probably go to Milwaukee or potentially sleep with Lana, um, provided that you are uh, okay with possibly incurring the wrath of an angry, uh, big, muscly Bulgarian man. But Milwaukee gets a big chant here, and this match goes about as far as you would expect from Becky Lynch taking on Lana, where Lana, try as hard as she might, just is, you know, several rungs below Becky on the uh, wrestler scale, and Becky pretty effortlessly dispatches of her with the disarm her for the submission win. Backstage, Aiden is asked about... What is this Milwaukee thing? And can you, you know, can you elaborate on it? And Aiden says this week, no, but tune in next week because he has a video proof of whatever the hell he is referencing. So I am excited. Is Raw, Raw, is SmackDown in Milwaukee next week? That would be great. I don't know. Speaking of being in places that aren't normally a place you would be at, in wrestling, we have the final segment of the night, which is the big contract signing for AJ Styles and Samoa Joe's WWE Championship rematch in Sydney, Sydney Australia, or is it Melbourne? I don't know. Super showdown. And Paige is, of course, moderating this. And then, you know, she kind of immediately says she has taken extra caution because we all know how these things tend to go down. AJ Styles comes out first and talks about how basically he's ready to take on Joe. 
no matter what. And, you know, is let's do this. And he Joe's music plays. He's waiting for him to come out. He signs the contract as Joe's music is playing. And Joe doesn't come out. And AJ is confused. And so is Paige. Because Paige is like, oh, he told me he would uh, be here on time. And AJ grabs the mic saying, you know, where the hell are you, Joe? Or I, I know you're probably going to attack me from behind because that's your thing. But, you know, I got eyes in the back of my head. Which, maybe that's why AJ has all of that hair. To hide his um, disturbing second set of eyes that are in the back of his skull. Um, we'll never know because Samoa Joe popped up on the screen. Kind of in like a, a FaceTime cell phone video. Um, he is clearly not in the arena. He is in a, a neighborhood. And he talks about, hey, you know, I was going to be there, but nah. And shows us where he is. And he shows a, a mailbox that says Styles. And finally, like I said weeks ago when I was like, man, it'd be cool if, AJ, if Joe just went to AJ's house to like mess with him. And that is exactly what Joe does here. He shows that he is in front of AJ Styles' home in Gainesville, Georgia. Hundreds of miles or thousands of miles away from um, Denver, Colorado. AJ is understandably furious about this and freaking out. And Joe is just going on and on saying, uh, you know, yeah, I'm in front of your house. And, you know, there's consequences to your actions, AJ. Uh, you know, you stole the championship from me at Hell in a Cell. And you're going to pay for that, basically. And he talks about how, you know, AJ feeling helpless right now, aren't you? And this whole time, AJ is like, he's mad, but he's actually, like, pleading with Joe to go away. Like, like he even straight up says, like, I'm Joe, I'm begging you. Like, don't do this, dude. Don't do this, man. Like, get away from my house. Leave my family alone. Just desperately trying to to talk joe uh down from whatever joe is going to do and joe is just reveling in this he just kind of and also just relatively uh, pretty much ignoring aj's pleas um he gets closer to the house he's like talking about oh you know you've done pretty well for yourself aj nice house you even got like a literal white picket fence look at you you've always had a uh, taste for the classics and you know, like I can see now that you're you're scared, you're anxious, and that fear is now turning into rage, probably. And you know, fear is as, as Yoda taught us. You know, fear leads to anger, and anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. Um, which I would imagine that's I'm sure that's where Joe's going. He's basically like a fat Samoan Yoda. I've always said that. And I guess the suffering will be when Joe takes the WWE Championship from AJ at the Super Showdown. He goes up to the front door and talks about how, you know, both of them know that AJ's family is home right now. And that he he's even brought a gift for young Annie, AJ's uh, youngest child, his daughter. And he shows us a, a baby doll, a kind of creepy looking baby doll, which to me, all baby dolls are kind of creepy. I don't think there's a baby doll that's like, oh, like there's like, eh, it's a fake little person. And it's got those eyelids that move on their own and can scare the crap out of you when you pick it up off the ground when the eyes are closed and they flip open because you moved it uh those aren't those aren't cool <laughs> um but he's got one of those for annie and he's like the the last thing to do is to see uh if anyone you know i could kick the i think he's like oh you know i could kick the door down and just kind of let myself in but that would be rude so i'll just ring the doorbell and he rings the doorbell and we don't get to see what happens. The show ends abruptly. Like, the last thing we see is Joe hitting the doorbell and having this big old evil smile in his face. And then and then all of a sudden, the, the Purge TV show starts. And it's like, ah, oh, like, ah, oh. it's, it's a weird way to end the show. But I also like, I like cliffhangers. I think that's a cool cliffhanger of what happened. What did Samoa Joe, did he just like, did something that did, did Wendy answer? Did he actually interact with his family? Or did he do some like Rocco's Modern Life ding dong ditch? He just rang the doorbell and then hid in a bush and just kind of chuckled as Wendy opened the door and was like, What's what's going on? What's 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 this baby doll doing here? And then she goes to pick it up and the eyes flip open and she's like, Ah Um, maybe that happened. I don't know. AJ doesn't know either, but he um presumably will have to uh take a very uh, fast flight, uh, a bullet train if if we had those back to Gainesville to see um, if his family has not been assaulted by this um, this terrorizing um, villain. But yeah, that's SmackDown Live. Um, 
decent show, a, a good show, I think. I, I like uh, some good storyline stuff. I think this, uh, the Joe AJ stuff keeps adding uh, new things to keep it interesting, new layers uh, to the to the storyline, which is appreciated. I'm, I like that they both they have two cliffhangers kind of, or maybe three cliffhanger things right now because it's like. You got the the Milwaukee thing with Aiden and and, and Rusev. Like, want to know what's going on there? So I've got. I want to watch next week to see what that's all about. I want to watch next week to see what happened with Samoa Joe and AJ's house. And I'm also want to know who Randy Orton's next target is. Who is who? It will be next on his hit list. We we need to find that out too. So SmackDown is doing a good job right now of presenting interesting questions that. At least me personally, as a fan, I, I want to see answered. I want to see things. So they're, they're, they've been pretty good about setting things up to get you to tune in next week, which is very important when you're doing a weekly TV show. And yeah, uh, once again, they, unlike Raw, they do a really good job of not focusing. Like, they're really only focusing on the Super Showdown right now. They don't, they haven't even mentioned Crown Jewel or even Evolution, really. It's just they have that one show. So it's a much more focused show than Raw which has to touch on all three of those shows at some point in the night and even actively building towards the, you know one of the matches that doesn't matter in a grand scheme of things and Undertaker versus uh, Triple H. So well, Raw feels uh, a bit scatterbrained with the one story kind of between the Shield and uh, the Dogs of War trio uh, kind of dominating things. Uh, SmackDown is kind of, they're building towards one pay-per-view, the, the, most, the one that's closest. And just telling the stories that lead to that and, and setting up interesting things in the future. So it's nice. Overall, what I'm saying is that it's nice to not hear the names of all these different shows and, and, and trying to keep track of what's happening at what. So decent, totally fun, solid show here. And thanks for listening, guys. I'll be back next week for my review of Monday Night Raw. If you want to uh, follow me on Twitter, you can do so at MarcusStewart7. And tell me what you thought about the show. And as always, you can find the show, depending on what platform you're listening to, you can find it on other platforms, on YouTube, iTunes, and Podbean, at Marcus Writes About Games. Uh, be sure to like, listen, subscribe. As I always say, the, the Triforce of Awesome, at least when it comes to this social media nonsense, if you do so, I greatly appreciate it. So... Until next time, wrestling fans, I'll see you next week.